In this video, we're going to specify our kind of zero order picture of the nature of a quantum state of a molecule, of course, focusing on excited states, molecules in excited states, and then talk a little bit about how our, that understanding of the quantum state of a molecule informs our understanding of the relative rates of photophysical transitions and how the selection rules operate to make some transitions more allowed than others. So we've really talked about three aspects of the quantum mechanical nature of a molecule, the electronic configuration, the nuclear configuration, and the spin. At zero order, these three aspects of a quantum state are separable, and this means that the overall wave function is a product of the three different aspects, electronic, vibrational, and spin. This means that they can be thought of as independent of one another, and this is not going to hold true in general when we start moving to first order corrections involving perturbations, where we mix, for example, the vibrational and electronic wave functions. The electronic wave function refers to the orbital configuration, and this is typically in the sigma system and for pi bonds between just two atoms, the natural bond orbital configuration. Huckel orbitals are used to describe delocalized pi systems. These are aromatics or other systems characterized by multiple resonance forms in which pi electrons are moving around. But at the end of the day, all Huckel orbitals are are just uniquely shaped orbitals with somewhat different energies, right? The occupancy, the energy, and the shape of the Huckel MOs goes into the electronic orbital configuration, just like the natural bond orbitals. If we're thinking in terms of sigma and pi systems at right angles to one another, those can actually be thought of as more or less independent of one another, at least at zero order. Now, the vibrational wave function includes the spatial dependences and the occupancies of, of all vibrational modes. So we'll get the vibrational wave functions values over space, we'll get essentially how many quanta of vibrational excitation we have associated with each of those vibrational modes. Very often we only think about one and there are good reasons for that that we may or may not get into a little bit later. And then finally, the electron spins, and in particular those spins of the unpaired electrons that are located in the SOMOs, the singly occupied molecular orbitals are, are profoundly relevant. And so here um, it's really a question of singlet versus triplet. And we can use, for example, the alpha and beta designators that we identified earlier in the vector model of spin to give these a, a bit more precise form. But for our purposes, just thinking in terms of singlet versus triplet will be totally fine. Just as a quick note of notation, for vibrational modes, you'll see the Greek letter nu used to indicate the number of vibrational uh, quanta of excitation, we might say, that a molecule particularly has, and occasionally you'll see a subscript or a something in parentheses to designate which vibrational mode we're talking about, right? So, you know, say the first vibrational mode is excited with, you know, three vibrational quanta, or the quantum number is three, is another way to put that. You may see something like this in describing vibrational wave functions. The orbital configuration will just be a molecular electron configuration, an electron configuration in terms of uh, molecular orbitals, NBO and or Huckel orbitals. So take a molecule like formaldehyde, H2CO, like you see right here, an NBO description of this molecule would be something like sigma CH2, sigma prime CH2 to indicate the other sigma orbital, sigma CO2, pi CO2, and then designators for the two n orbitals, NO2, NO prime 2, for example, is the orbital configuration of ground state formaldehyde. So that's all about quantum states. In thinking about transitions between quantum states, we might start by thinking, all right, there is a theoretical maximum rate to a transition between quantum states for two states that are extremely similar in essence, right? The probability of a transition is very high. But the differences between the initial and final states introduce what we might call prohibition factors. These F values that are generally speaking less than one that are going to 
decrease the observed rate constant of a transition relative to our theoretical maximum. And because the wave functions are separable, electronic, vibrational, and spin, these prohibition factors are also on some sense separable. We can think about them separately, right? There's an electronic one, a vibrational one, and a spin one. And so our next natural question is, how do we go about calculating or at least even thinking about these prohibition factors? And this goes back to our earlier discussion of transition probability and the really essential nature of that overlap integral. Here we're going to call that something a little bit different and introduce a term that you'll very commonly see in the literature of excited states and, and quantum chemistry. This H in angle brackets is called the matrix element. And it's the perturbation matrix element. It is the matrix element of the perturbation or interaction H that facilitates the transition from the final to the initial wave function. I'm realizing that these are actually backwards. The final wave function should appear here and the initial wave function should appear here. I will fix that on the slides. Um, the reason this is called a matrix element is because when the perturbation is represented as a matrix in the basis of possible quantum states, the value that shows up in the row corresponding to the final state and the column corresponding to the initial state is the matrix element value. And it captures the overlap of the initial and final wave functions subject to the interaction or perturbation. And that does not appear on the slide, but that's important to say that the initial wave function is perturbed and has some probability of changing into the final wave function. And that is captured by the matrix element. The matrix element divided by the energy difference squared is a rough measure of the prohibition factor. And so intuitively, the greater the difference, right, the greater the difference in energy, and the smaller the matrix element, the smaller is this F value and the lower is the rate. Important intuition to keep in mind that an idea we'll actually return to when we talk about the energy gap law. Delta E, the extent of the difference in energy between the states, matters, as does the matrix element. And this is for the time being a very qualitative relationship, but one that gives us good intuition for appreciating whether a transition will be relatively fast or slow. For example, if we know values of delta E for a series.